friends, good time of day, wherever you are joining us this time. I want to welcome you to this event, the Black Clergy Network of United Church event, our third annual emancipation panel discussion. This year, we will be looking at the theme, a case for reparation. I am Franklin James. I am a facilitator of the Black Clergy Network. And I am coming to you from Prince Edward Island as the minister of West River United Church. As we're about to start the dis discussion, I'd like to um, start with a quote I come to love from James Baldwin who said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I hope as we listen to these discussions and the many voices, we will glean something that we can take into our lives and in our ministries and in our work. Let us pray. Holy God, we gather for the third annual Emancipation Day panel. We thank you for the progress made and ask our guidance in the work yet to be done as we embark on these journeys and conversation of reparations. We acknowledge the suffering of our generations past and those present and seek your comfort and strength. Let's approach this event with unity, respect and open hearts. Listen to each perspective and ask, O oh God, that you grant us wisdom and courage to confront inequality and be agents of justice and reconciliation. Bless the panelists, moderator, and the participants with wisdom and compassion. May we all be inspired with action towards healing. We ask your blessing upon the Black Courage Network the United Church of Canada and its foundation so that our efforts will be fruitful. Amen. And at this time, I have the wonderful privilege to introduce to you someone we all know and love, someone I've worked with and come to respect, even though she abandoned me for other things, but I'm very happy for her. Friends, welcome Reverend Marlene Britton as our moderator. Marlene is a diaconal minister with deeply treasured Caribbean roots. She was born and raised in Jamaica, served her first four years of ministry in Belize. Then she was sent to Barbados where she served for 16 years in ministry. She then transferred to the United Church of Canada, where she has been serving for the past 10 years. She is currently the Director of Policies and Programs for Ministry and Personnel in the United Church of Canada. Marlene is the mother of two adult sons, and may I say proud mother of two adult sons. Marlene, over to you, and thank you for being you with us, everyone. Blessings to you. Thank you so much, Franklin, for those words of welcome to all of us and for those, for the words of introduction. I did not abandon you. I was transferred to another area of ministry and we serve together in this church of ours. Welcome everyone, and it is my great pleasure to serve in this way as your moderator for this evening. It is significant that we are holding this discussion on this day, August the 6th, which is the Independence Day of the nation of Jamaica. Independent nation granted independence from England and in the process, beginning the process of becoming a republic to enshrine 
that full personhood, countryhood, I don't know what the word is, for being fully released from England. So yes, it is a grand day on which to be having this particular discussion on reparations. And as we have these discussions, we know that it is important for all our peoples represented here in this um, circle. And as I recognize that the circle contains even for the panelists, people from different, her different areas of heritage and people who are operating in various countries. In that vein, I want to acknowledge that we are here sitting in our various homes, in our various offices, on lands which were the homelands of various indigenous peoples from many years past. Those of us in Canada recognize that we were not the first peoples here and we are very, very grateful for the work, the welcome and the continued witness of our indigenous brothers and sisters. We respect the land on which we live and promise to continue to walk in covenant with those who are our siblings. On this panel this evening, I have the good fortune of sharing with persons who are of um, signal, not just honorable folks, but folks who have made their marks in wonderful ways in their various areas of study or vocation or both. I will introduce each person as in the order in which they will speak later on, but I'll do all the introductions right now. So with us this evening, we have Carol Duncan, who is Professor of Religion and Culture at the Wilfred Laurier University, where she's taught for 26 years. She holds a PhD in sociology from York University. Her, her research focuses on Caribbean religions in trans, transnational and diasporic contexts, black church studies in North America and religion and popular culture. Professor Duncan is also a published creative fiction writer. Welcome, Carol. Carol is not new to the circle as she was with us last year for these discussions as well. Also with us is the Reverend Dr. Teresa Burnett Cole, who is the coordinating minister at Glebe St. James United Church in Ottawa, the nation's capital. Born and raised in Southwestern Ontario, Teresa studied at both Western University and at the University of Toronto. Her doctoral work is in the area of liturgical studies and focused on Anishinaabe worship. She has served congregations in the Maritimes, Saskatchewan, Toronto, and now Ottawa. Teresa also serves on the General Council Executive as the Indigenous Representative. In this capacity, she also serves on the National Indigenous Council. She serves on the executive of the Eastern Ontario Woodaway Region and the Gathering Advisory Board. So because she's on the National Indigenous Council, she was also at a meeting last week. So we were together up until Tuesday of this week. So when we started here, she said, ha, huh, haven't seen you in such a long time. That's Teresa Why? Welcome, Teresa. Isaac. Isaac Saini. Isaac is a Black Studies and Cuba Specialist at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. He's an Associate Prof and the Coordinator of the Black and African Diaspora Studies 
the first major in Black and African diaspora studies in the Caribbean. So we should do, yay. His teaching, research, and scholarship encompass Cuba, Africa, the Caribbean, Black Canadian history, the global Black Caribbean liberation struggle, sorry, and reparations. He holds a PhD in history from the School of Oriental and African Studies, the University of London. He is the author of Cuba, A Revolution in Motion. A major area of his research is Cuba's relationship with Africa, resulting in the recent book, Cuba, Africa, and Apartheid's End, Africa's Children Return, which was published this year. Isaac also directed Dalhousie's Transition Year Program, the groundbreaking program founded in 1970 to redress the educational barriers and injustices that confront the Mi'kmaq Nation, other indigenous peoples in Canada, and the African Nova Scotia community. From 2008 to 2022, he served as co-chair and national spokesperson of the Canadian Network on Cuba, with which he now serves in an advisory capacity. His roots lie in the African Nova Scotia community and the Caribbean. Welcome, Isaac. And our fourth panelist is the Reverend Dr. Steed Verniel. Never knew what the V was all these years. Davidson. And I say all these years because Steed was my senior when we were both in theological seminary several decades ago. So um, yes, so it is a pleasure to share with Steed in this way. Steed serves as the executive director of the Society of Biblical Literature. Prior to this position, prior to this position, he has been seminary professor and academic dean in Berkeley, California, and Chicago, Illinois. His teaching career in higher education began in Decorah, Iowa, at an undergraduate college. He has authored, edited and contributed to several published books and academic journals. His forthcoming work is a co-edited volume titled Queering the Prophet on Jonah and Other Activists. Dr. Davidson is an elder in the New York Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. Nurtured in the Methodist Church on the island of Tobago, he has lived in various parts of the Caribbean and to the United States for either school or work. Welcome, Steve. So you see what I mean when I say that this panel is really a star-studded one. So in that vein, I am really honored to be here and maybe we should use the Oscar uh, method of ensuring that we stay on track with all these stars involved. But as we proceed this evening, I am inviting all of those who are present to ensure that you participate as fully as you would like to. And while we are going to encourage you to participate, we are going to encourage you to not to interrupt speakers as they're presenting, but to use the Q&A feature that you should find either at the bottom of your screen or at the sides, depending on the device which you might be using and record your questions there. That screen will be monitored, is being monitored and the questions will be posed to the panelists at an appropriate time during the evening's presentation. But please do feel free to participate and uh, reflect questions as you see the need. 
what will happen is that I will ask each panelist a question and invite them to reflect with us on those questions. And, and as we do that, to invite you then to make your notes and participate as you see fit. There will be time for a general uh, question and answer session um, later on in the evening's proceedings. So let's begin with our first panelists. And I'm going to invite Carol to be our first one up um, in the cricketing world, we'd say the opening batsman, uh, and I invite you to reflect on the question, what does reparations mean? Well, two questions, if I might, Carol, and to also ask, what could a process of reparations look like given Canada's colonial history and current political climate? Thank you very much, uh, Marlene, for the introduction. Greetings to all who are in the audience. I'm delighted to be here on this occasion to have this discussion. It's not an easy one, but it's a necessary one because we are living out our ancestors' trajectory from my perspective. And we are also living out in many ways the questions of what to do in the wake of a cataclysmic occasion, cataclysmic social and economic and political upheaval after the ending of slavery, after 400 years for Africans in the Americas. My comments will be addressed specifically to the British context, the British colonial context, and uh, in the British Empire, enslavement of Africans was abolished August 1st, 1834, with a four year period in some territories um, until 1838, in which finally uh, the bonds were lifted. However, we know that one of the uh, legacies of enslavement is the modern concept of race and the experiences of racism, the racial categorization of humanity in a hierarchical structure and disproportionate uh, resources in terms of uh, the category of whiteness. And so that legacy is still with us today. These are, as I said, contentious and hard, but very necessary discussions to have. So what does reparation mean within that general context? To me, reparations focus on healing and redressing long-term consequences and present day effects of the legacy of enslavement and the ideology of race and the practices of racism which have resulted in disproportionate rates of poverty, inadequate housing, food insecurity, health discrimination, and disenfranchisement. To me, it's also important to think about reparations for slavery in the context of colonialism in Canada and the disenfranchisement of indigenous persons here on this land. The question of what to do in this aftermath is not a new one. When we look at how the modern world, and by modern, I'm referring to the late 15th century to our time, how the modern world was made, we have to take into consideration that this trade linking Africa, Europe, and the Americas involved multiple crossings of numerous peoples, some by, cho by choice, excuse me, others enforced either politically, economically, or socially. And the troubling histories of genocidal practices and expropriation of lands. Reparations is contentious precisely because it deals with issues like fairness and responsibility 
often in talking with some of my students, the question comes up from a historical perspective where students may say, depending on where they are in the uh, story, well, you know, this is, that was then, this is now, who's responsible? Is it individual or societal? Is it a matter of institutions? And which ones? Is it the legal system? Is it educational? What about the church and other religious institutions? Is it really a moral or a political issue? And so here, I want to uh, draw our attention to the two dimensions of, uh, main dimensions of reparations. Uh, retributive, the idea of focusing on rep retribution or repayment for wrong acts by perpetrators, and the idea of restorative justice, which focuses on the restoration or correction of aspects of victims' lives and can include, for example, financial compensation, access to healing resources, therapeutic processes, and so on. For me, it's necessary to really address the restorative. That's where my focus and energy and thinking about represent, uh, uh, reparations uh, lies. But the retributive, often this is the point of stiction in terms of questions of responsibility. And in many ways it can uh, present itself almost as a kind of red herring bogey figure because it can detract from dealing with uh, the real tough issues. So the question of redress, as I said earlier, it's not a new one, it's an old one. And in terms of slavery in the British Empire, there were reparations, but not for the enslaved initially, for those who actually held others in bondage. Uh, huge amounts of money uh, were paid to planters in the British West Indies as a compensation for the loss of property. We have examples too of reparations that were partial in terms of uh, a political experiment of reconstruction in the United States. The famous decree of 40 acres and a mule for enslaved Africans post-slavery. Canada, as far as I know, made no such promises. What we have in Canada is a kind of cultural amnesia really around the whole question of enslavement of Africans, even though the practice lasted for almost, two, oh, well, actually over 200 years, from 1620s until 1834. There's often a pointing to the Underground Railroad and as important as that history is in terms of escape from slavery, it is not in itself reparations. Right? Underground Railroad, from my perspective, is a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, um, uh, I would say activist uh, movement of the 18th and 19th centuries. And it holds important lessons about duration, about collaboration for us, but at the same time, it can distort the Canadian context. So what does reparation look like, the focus on restorative justice, knowing that also the question of retributive justice lingers there? I point to the aspect of truth seeking. And so the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, and we have examples from post-apartheid South Africa, um, as instructive perhaps for the Canadian context Canada, South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia share a history of being white settler colonies within the context of British Empire. There's been no Truth and Reconciliation Commission around slavery in the Canadian context. Why recount these atrocities and abuses? How is it possible 189 years later to do so? Here we look at the legacy and the impact and we have examples and we also have data to support um, the ideas about the legacies around racism. I think also it's important, and I'm going to wrap up here, to think about uh, reparations 
within the context of 21st uh, century Canada um, as a country which is dealing with deep ideological divisions about what it means to be a nation, uh, what it means to be uh, Canadian. We're also living in a time uh, that I would characterize as culture wars played out in social media and at the ballot box. Some would suggest that these are fueled uh, by and conservative voting patterns and politics south of the border in the US leaking into Canada. But I think blaming our neighbors to the US is a very short lived and irresponsible response. We need to do the hard work of looking at our own political and cultural history concerning citizenship, nation building, and its links to Canada's colonial history. It may be 189 years, but in storyteller time, it's very close. My great-great-grandfather was born in June 1833 in Montserrat. He was a long lifer and he was a teller of stories. And he told his stories to my grandmother, his granddaughter born in 1902. He was the last of the first and she was the first of the last born at the turn of the 20th century. She told me her stories. And so that thread and that connection in that line is there in terms of the connection to that particular historical trajectory as a descendant myself. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in the discussion. Thank you very much, Carol. And <clears throat> you are really on point, not just with your presentation and linking it to our social context today, but on time as well. So what I didn't say to everyone is that each panelist will have 10 minutes uh, within which to respond to the question uh, that it is posed to them. And uh, then they'll have three minutes when everybody has presented to respond to each other, to comment on what each person has said. So if you weren't making notes when Carol was just speaking, make them now before you forget. All right. Okay, so our second presenter is Teresa, the Reverend Dr. Teresa Burnett Cole. And Teresa, there are many similarities between the Black and Indigenous communities. What lessons from the Indigenous experience would be helpful in the Black struggle? Please unmute yourself, Teresa. Not that we haven't done this for 10 million dozen times. Let me try that again. <laughs> Sego, uh, uh, hello, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, uh, this is a very different thing than uh, where I've been the last few weeks, where I've been involved in um, a spiritual gathering for Indigenous folk across the United Church of Canada. And uh, Carol, I really appreciated what you had to say about restorative and uh, retributive um, uh, justice. Um, I can't help thinking that um, we're at a place with um, Black history in Canada um, that the Indigenous community was in uh, as, as late as five to ten years ago. Um, and the educational piece, um, it, 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 it amazes me. We have um, an educational system which is completely colonial, focused on the white experience. And um, when Indigenous history was taught, it was taught in social studies, not as Canadian history. And um, I wonder about uh, where black history is needs to be inserted into the educational programs because um as you say the stories have to get out there um so the indigenous experience is similar and different uh as uh, both marlene and carol mentioned um 
we are the original peoples uh, of of the this territory. In Canada, that's actually about five percent of the population. At least five percent that the government uh, recognizes, and of course that includes the First Nations peoples, the Métis, and the Inuit. And uh, I was thinking, uh, Carol, when you talked about the legacies of uh, slavery, uh, the whole concept of blood quantum, whether you were um, uh, Indian or you were Métis or you were um, half-blood, that comes directly uh, from the slave trade. And that's the language uh, that Canadian law used when they uh, enshrined in 1876 the Indian Act. Um, the Indian Act is, put bluntly, a piece of apartheid legislation, which is still um, on the books here in Canada. Um, I think all sides agree that we need to get rid of it, uh, but nobody knows for sure how that's going, going to happen. I think the, the most important thing I would want to say about the Indigenous experience as it relates to um, uh, the Black reparations uh, experience is that Indigenous people have been given nothing by the government. Uh, most of the Canadian law that involves Indigenous rights is based on judicial precedent and it's decided on a case-by-case -case basis. In other words, we take them to court, they lose in court, and we step forward. And over and over it goes. And it's really important to note that the impetus for these waves of legislation is fueled in large part by Indigenous activists and their allies. Um, as far as um, how compensation has unwrapped, um, I, I'm not sure the land claims part uh, would necessarily be helpful uh, to the Black community. Um, this is an ongoing issue. Last time I checked, 104% of Canadian uh, land was under um, uh, land claim. Uh, more than 100% because um, some territories overlapped. And literally, there is no way for the government, or so they say, to um, make um, a settlement that would cover everyone. So we have to do it band by band, area by area. And the treaties that have been uh, made with Indigenous communities in the past have either been ignored, not or honored, or treated in a miserly fashion. For example, the failure to pay annual annuities. Um, the, the one that really sticks up for me is Treaty Area 4, which is in Saskatchewan, where um, on Treaty Day, um, uh, it, Indians who are under the treaty have to line up and they receive a shiny $5 bill from an RCMP officer that they have to sign for because that was the annual annuity set back in the 19th century, since Sultan. Um, the uh, areas of um, reparation that might be helpful is looking at uh, how we've managed things like uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, okay? It met from 2007 to 2015. As Carol mentioned, it, you know, it was um, focused on the residential school system, uh, and they, it was reparations for the loss of language and culture brought on by the residential school experience. Individual students were compensated about $5 billion if they could provide enough proof that they had been involved. Now, just recently, 325 First Nations went uh, to court with the federal government, and they've made a deal which is going to cost about another $208 billion. 
and it's going to be compensating uh, the bands, not the individuals. A and the hope is that they will be able to revitalize their language and culture. It's entirely up to the First Nations how they're going to spend it, whether it's going to be cultural centers, language speakers, teachers, there's all kinds of possibilities. Um, they've been given one year to come up with a plan uh, that will have to be accepted by the government um, so that the rest of those funds will be released. Day scholars and home boarding settlements, those are still areas um, that are being negotiated because you may not know this, but not all residential school survivors were compensated under that act. Only certain uh, residential schools were included. Closer to, uh, I think the black experience is the 60s scoop, um, which talks about a time when, um, starting in the 60s and, and moving forward, uh, children were removed from their families and placed in foster care by welfare authorities. More children have now been impacted by that system than ever attended the residential schools. Um, again, there was a recent Supreme Court uh, case, 4.3 billion for children on reserves taken into foster care. Another 24 billion for um, individual compensation for families. And then there were the folks who were experimented on in hospitals or sterilized against their will. Those court cases are before the courts. There are drinking water settlements, uh, again, in the billions of dollars. Um, it just, the amount of money is staggering, but each time it's because a group of individuals have taken on the federal uh, government and had to use the courts to force reparations. And I wish it was going to be different for the black communities, but I have a feeling you're headed down the same path. The Canadian Charter of Rights in section 15 guarantees equality before and under the law. Well, that became the basis for demanding compensation for the removal of children for court, uh, for the welfare systems, et cetera. When I think about reparations, um, I think about four different areas. Financial compensation, the setting aside of money for individuals um, to do their healing, to do the restorative work that needs to be done. Um, I would love to see, for example, the establishment of a community trust uh, to set aside funds for Black youth-led projects or to buy back properties once owned by the Black community. Second, educational compensation. So yes, scholarships, yes, the creation of new um, Afrocentric schools, um, new programs that will run um, specialized programs like Isaac is involved in, uh, but also um, curric curriculum changes straight across the board. You know, in Saskatchewan, where the population is 50% Indigenous, they actually have uh, a rule that there has to be um, Indigenous historical content in every year of a, a, of a child's basic education. That shouldn't be any different than the Black community. They should have that opportunity as well. Third place of, of uh, restoration political representation. We need uh, politicians who understand what happened politically, who get colonialism, because I've, I find that a, a rather dramatic need that will not be, we will not be able to shift it until there are people in our uh, political system that can help do that work. And finally, you know, one of the things that, um, that was done uh, following the Truth and Reconciliation um, process was the foundation of a reparations center in uh, Winnipeg that could hold the history um, and deal with uh, 
helping people get at the truth. And I would love to see something like that for the black community. Um, we need historians to, to develop the history of black people in Canada, to write it up with a plan for educating the public. We need to tell the story of black slavery in Canada. You're absolutely right. The Underground Railroad is insufficient. We need to tell those stories of uh, the histories of geographic displacement and school segregation, which happened until way too recently. And the other thing I would uh, point to would be, there is a precedent in Canada of the Canadian, uh, the Canadians compensating Japanese Canadians uh, after uh, having uh, removed them to internment camps during the war. That compensation was uh, about 300 million. Um, 21,000, I think, went to each living survivor. Doesn't seem like a lot of money, but when I think of what could be done in the way of healing and restoration, it's stark. Um, theirs was only a short experience of three to four years. The black experience is much, much bigger. So we've got precedent. We've, we know it'll be a battle and it's worth doing. And, you know, just to conclude, last week at the National Indigenous Spiritual Gathering, I got to attend a, a colleague's presentation where she was an African Canadian um, making common cause with Indigenous folk and trying to uh, get at where the similarities are. Um, I was so glad to have been in her presentation. Uh, because it really jump-started what I needed to think about for this one. There are so many places where we can support one another. Um, it's high time we did. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you so much for that. Wow. So I didn't cut you off because it was just so much. And you've set the stage brilliantly for our next panelist to share. And I know he has done some work in the area of history as well. Um, but I'm going to invite Isaac to talk about what, or I'll just ask you a question. Why is reparation central to creating a more just, equitable, and a sustainable world for humanity. Well, well, first, thank you. It's a privilege and an honor to be on uh, this panel today. And I'm speaking to you from, obviously, the land, uh, uh, unsurrendered and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation here in Nova Scotia. And of course, Nova Scotia has a long standing history going back several centuries of people of African descent here. And uh, but of course, and one thing I'd like to sort of draw on before I get into addressing the question uh, that was made was the, the last comment about uh, the, the discussion about how we have the how where do does the black struggle for reparations, the global black liberation struggle, intersect with that of indigenous struggles here? Yeah. And it's important to bear in mind that there has been a long history, complicated though it may have been during in the Americas of joint black and uh, indigenous struggles. There's of course the famous Seminole struggle, uh, which people should read up on where, you know, escaped Africans, right, who had escaped from slavery, liberating themselves, merged with the Seminole nation in Florida, and then were able to resist uh, the U.S. Army, the Garifuna, for example, in the Caribbean. And here in Nova Scotia, in contemporary times, uh, the, the work between, uh, for example, Dr. Burnley Rocky Jones, working with Indigenous leaders like Noel, Mi'kmaq Elder Noel Norquid and, uh, all of, and the late Mi'kmaq Elder uh, Daniel Paul. And of course, there was, of course, in the United States, States, uh, the interaction and the cooperation and collaboration between the Black Panther Party and the American Indian movement. So there are these times where people have actually united and in these struggles. In terms of the question, I think uh, people, when people think of reparations, people often think of it in sort of crude neoliberal terms sometimes, which is 
created a distorted and discredited that it's about handing out money it's about in a sense the tedious task of identifying people who can directly uh, 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 trace them back themselves back to enslavement and of course when it comes to Canada where most of the population uh, uh, are people who've come uh, descended from people who've come to Canada fairly uh, recently right there's always they say well reparations doesn't apply to them right so one of the important points to bear in mind and I'm a member of the International Steering Group of the Global African Congress, uh, in which Sir Hilary Beckles, uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of West Indies, is a very important advisor and so forth, is that reparations is seen as transforming social relations, both within countries and between countries. And as many people know, we are living in a time where we face all-sided crisis, an ecological catastrophe uh, faces us. And it's important to under underscore that the, in, in 2022, the Intergovernmental Panel uh, of the United Nations that reports on climate change for the first time acknowledged that colonialism was a central driving force of the climate change and the ecological catastrophe that faces us. And of course, slavery is central to that. In a sense, we have the dispossession and the, uh, the attempted physical, complete physical genocide and cultural genocide of indigenous peoples and their subordination and marginalization. And then we have the brutal enslavement of Africans, right? And we have the disfiguring of the environment through plantation slavery, which has significantly affected climate. You know, when I teach about slavery in my courses, I often say that slavery is characterized by, of course, the incredible brutal ex uh, br uh, exploitation, oppression, and dehumanization of enslaved Africans, right? And the millions, right? a minimum of 12 to 15 million that are ripped from the shores of Africa and from the interior and brought to the brought to the Americas with perhaps another 20 to 25% more dying uh, uh, on the voyage, right? And of course, as we acknowledge Emancipation Day, um, you know, 800 enslaved Africans in the British Empire were so-called liberated, right? And there's two points I always make. Well, 40% of all the enslaved Africans who made it uh, 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 to the Americas alive about 40% of them ended up in the Caribbean. So you're talking at least of five to six million people, and yet the population was only 800,000. So that speaks to the mortality and incredible exploitation. So climate change, uh, in a sense, as I was talking about, is a central feature of what this colonial process has done to disfigure the geography. In fact, it's now acknowledged that those countries that were the most affected by slavery and colonialism are going to be the countries that are most vulnerable uh, to climate change. Uh, in the Caribbean, we already see countries that are losing land, right? That perhaps will disappear in the 21st and maybe the 22nd century. So this is a key point. But also linked to climate change is the cost of trying to alleviate and mitigate the impact. Getting back to the story I tell about slavery, the, the enslaved Africans who were brought across and the tremendous mortality rate of, of five, uh, the five or six million who arrived and only 800,000 uh, being left when um, it, so emancipation takes place is the fact that, that the tremendous inequality and uneven distribution of wealth that exists into the world today is a direct result of these policies. And so when we look at the cost that people talk about, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, right, necessary, in fact, trillion dollars to sort of uh, prepare these countries to face climate change, it's important to understand that uh, this incredible inequality and the wealth that has been accumulated in the North has come off the dispossession of indigenous peoples in the Americas and the incredible brutal exploitation of enslaved Africans, right? I think this is indisputable. We know that when emancipation happened, and it's a myth that spread the two myths of emancipation that on uh, that on August uh, in 1834 in August, people were liberated. But we know there was a period of apprenticeship. But we also know that the only people who were compensated financially were the owners, right? The British government took out a loan of 20 million pounds. That was 40% of their budget allocation for that year, 5% of their GDP. In today's term, that would amount to 100 and over $150 billion, right? And so in a sense, the incredible inequalities in wealth that we see 
okay, uh, are a direct result of the, not only the theft of wealth that took place uh, during the period of colonialism and transatlantic slave trade, but the ongoing pattern and dynamics that lead to a continual transfer of wealth from the Caribbean, from Africa, from the global south into the hands, right, of um, northern financiers, right, into the hands of, we can say, the, you know, the big capitalist class, right, that exists in the north. Uh, the late great uh, Norman Govan, who was a major political economist coming out of the Caribbean, and I used to talk about the reparations, CARICOM reparations plan. Uh, CARICOM is suing 14 nations. In fact, uh, um, the Prime Minister Gonz uh, Gonzalez of um, St. Vincent just announced that they're going to be taking the reparations case to the International Criminal Court, to the International Court, to actually get a ruling. Okay, this is critically important. But we often said that reparations in that narrow conception of financial redress meant nothing if fundamental economic and social relations on a world scale, a new in short, a new international economic order was not established because the transfer of wealth still continues, right? Uh, there's a book, uh, How You... Uh, um, Britain underdeveloped the Caribbean, right? By Sir Hilary Beckles, that documents that even after slavery, even after that massive plundering of wealth off the backs of enslaved Africans, the British still left in place that, 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 that pattern of economics that continued to transfer wealth from the Caribbean. And we can talk about Africa, we can talk about the global south as well. So reparations is a is critically important because in a sense, it involves a conception of transforming society in ways that we can deal with the environment. We all recognize that the unknown, uh, or the, un, un, the uh, shall we say, the elephant that's ignored, the massive elephant, to use that tired and worn cliche, when we talk about climate change, is the economic system that is predatory, okay? The economic system that exists in the world today is not compatible Okay, with Pachamamba, as the Bolivians and the Quechua say, of Mother Earth. It's not compatible with a livable human environment. It's not compatible with generating a world of equity and, and, and equality in terms of the distribution of resources and so forth. So in a sense, reparations is important, not just for people of African descent, not just about uh, acknowledging the history of enslavement and then saying in order to, 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 uh, to uh, compensate for the, the constellation of values the constellation of ideas, the practices like segregation, the practices uh, of difference and disenfranchisement that spring directly from slavery, that we need some sort of monetary compensation. No, it's much more. It's about transforming the world, transforming the social relations between countries, as I've said, and within uh, countries, right? And uh, in the first presentation by, um, by Professor Duncan, uh, she clearly mentioned that within Canada, we have a fight over this narrative, right? A clear fight over this narrative, okay? About what, what about the history of Canada itself? And when it comes to emancipation, I always like to point out a number of issues. And I gave a, a, a presentation just recently. Uh, one is that when we think of emancipation day, as it was pointed out uh, by, uh, by, uh, by Teresa, um, in terms of indigenous people, people, uh, the government hasn't given anything to indigenous people. So when we look at Emancipation Day, it wasn't through the magnanimity. So reparations is about also about rewriting the history, rewriting, uh, challenging these narratives of black subservience and hapless, helplessness, right? It's important to understand that Emancipation Day, uh, um, the, the, uh, the act ending slavery in the British Empire was driven by African resistance, right? And in fact, there was a rebellion in Jamaica, uh, the uh, so-called Baptist War, right? Led by Sam Sharp that began as a peaceful uh, protest and then developed into a rebellion in 1831, 1832, okay? That was so shocked the British ruling class that they realized that either they granted emancipation, I ended and abolished slavery on their terms, or Africans would abolish slavery on their th uh, on their own terms and perhaps establish uh, Haitian revolutions across the Caribbean, right? So Africans have been at the center of their story of, of, of liberation. And so in a sense, when we come back to reparations, why is it at the center of human liberation, right? By transforming the economic and social relations in the world, we will contribute to, in a sense, mitigating the climate disaster that threatens humanity. It will also, in many ways, 
uh, uh, redress the kind of massive economic social inequalities that exist uh, that have created much of the problems we see in the world today. Uh, in a sense, we live in a world where we see wars that are waging, for example. Uh, we see the fact that certain lives are valued while others aren't valued and so forth. And uh, we know this is incompatible with an equitable and peaceful world. So reparations is not just simply, and it cannot be simply about, as uh, Hillary Beckles and others have argued, and myself have argued, it's not about money even though that's a critical important point of transferring resources. It's about reimagining the world we live in, a world in, in which every human being, in which every culture, in which every uh, ethnicity and every nation, right, is treated equally, and in which redress is made for profound historical disadvantage. Colonialism, the dispossession and attempted genocide of indigenous people, and the transatlantic slave system are central for creating the world we live in. And therefore, to make a world that's fit for human, human beings, we have to address and uh, address, mitigate, and in fact, transform the conditions that are directly inherited uh, from, the, from those processes. I'll stop there for the moment. But uh, last point I'd like to make is I am optimistic. I know it's hard for people to be optimistic about the future, but I'm optimistic in the young people, in the young people who have driven idle no more in the young people who drove the George Floyd rebellion, right? It was young people in the United States and it was young people here in Canada, black led across in both the United States and Canada, but also multiracial, multi-ethnic, okay, re uh, uprisings that basically demonstrated that it is possible for people to not only challenge the existing system, but to have a different conception and imagination of the world we're living in. So in many cases, reparation at its most fundamental level is a reimagining of the world, a more just world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. Huh, not about money. Hmm. Not all we, about money. We, 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 we could hear some folks saying, from the other side, exactly. It is, can't be all about money, but anyway, we, we will leave that there for now and we will come back as we have some, a chance to, to respond money, money as, the panel, as the panelists have a chance to respond to, to you. All right, so Steed, um, you are up. I want to say Steed Vernil. Ah. Every time I get a chance. So, based upon the Christian virtue of forgiveness, shouldn't people of African descent follow this biblical teaching? Forgive the atrocities of slavery and forego the demand for reparations? Isn't forgiveness a biblical practice sufficient to eliminate the call for reparations? Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a those are pressing questions, which I'll try to see if I could explain a, a, a bit. And and because I'm going to reference several biblical texts, I'll share my screen so I don't have to spend a lot of time um, uh, reading uh, uh, the citations that I that I have. Um, so breaches and relationships find healing both in the virtue of forgiveness and repair in the broken relationship. So two, two things need to happen at the same time. Repair quite often takes the form of restitution. And I think there's a sense in which we, we value what we think is this abstract notion of, of forgiveness, not recognizing that restitution carries with it the um, dealing with the material conditions that have been created as a result of the of the breaches, and I, and I think you know Professor Saini has been itemizing many of those in his in his in his in his comments. The principle of equal ret uh, restitution guides what is known as lex talionis in the in the ancient world, and lex talionis is more popularly understood as an eye for an eye. That is to say, you don't exact more than was. Uh, lost um, as a result. And this was a, a sort of a moderating um, Im um, impulse. Uh, the, uh, let's go. The, in the practice of enslavement in the, 
ancient world. This appears, this principle of lex talionis appears even though ancient slavery was not always, not always an adversarial institution, but it was at times. There are some in instances and some experiences where it was adversarial. In the cases where someone was enslaved, even for indebtedness, the end of their indenture was always accompanied by some resource to enable their full functioning in the society, as we see in this in this statement from Exodus, where, where ex this, this legislation in Exodus requires that the enslaved leave without debt. In other words, they should not come in poorer than they should not leave poorer than when they came, when they came in. But we also have instances of a more progressive expectation in the book of Deuteronomy that requires enslavers to do more than just let the person go free, but in some ways to provision them with the kinds of goods that are needed to ensure their own development and advancement within, within the society. But this generous provision occurs in Deuteronomy, unlike what we see in the book of Leviticus, because in Leviticus, Basically, Leviticus does a, a unique thing, unlike Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, as according to, to what we, we saw, refuses to admit the enslavement of co-ethnics. But for, uh, sorry, Deuteronomy allows for the um, enslavement of co-ethnics, of co right? Israelites could enslave other Israelites. For Leviticus, this is an unthinkable situation. And in fact, what you'll see in Leviticus is this creation of a, of a system of bond laborers or indentureship, which was, not which was not enslavement. I recently had to review a book um, where someone was referencing a particular text out of, out of, out of Jeremiah and, and trying to clarify and make the point that the, the issue of slavery that was spoken of in those chapters, chapter 34 of Jeremiah, was quite different, was not um, what we know as enslavement today, or um, from in the in the modern world, and and I kept wondering why that that distinction was was necessary in order to shut down people's minds relative to the what's being evoked in biblical translations as enslavement. Um, there is this myth that some people have. Well. Um, enslavement, transatlantic slavery and enslavement was terrible. Indentureship in the ancient world was not. There, are, there is evidence that it was just as terrible in some instances. But anyway, Leviticus is basically saying, do not, do not ever um, enslave your own, your own people, while Deuteronomy allows for it. But Leviticus does this particular thing. Because systems, economic systems, require cheap labor whenever they could get it. So if Leviticus is Im imagining a, uh, a society where fellow co-ethnics are not enslaved, though it is not as if there's no slavery going to be practiced in the society. Leviticus is basically saying you get them from foreigners. And, and, and you can see the, the stirrings of what, will, you know, what can become chattel slavery in this ancient le uh, legislation. Uh, from, from Leviticus, and advocating in many ways a harsher treatment uh, for enslaved foreigners. Enslavement in whatever system creates, uh, you know, I would argue, an adversarial relationship among the participants, since what you have is exploitation. That, that enslavement or indentureship or whatever else you want to call it, as it, as it um, have existed in different parts of the world at different times, is a way not of a generous provision for people to catch themselves, but a way of exploiting those who are vulnerable and weak. And so if you have an inherently exploitative uh, relationship, when that relationship comes to an end, there is a settling of accounts that's needed. And so what we have here in, in Exodus is when, when enslavement ends in Egypt, through a form of escape, um, I, I, I would argue, as, as the Israelites are escaping Egyptian slavery, they take matters into their own hands and request repayment from the Egyptians um, and that the Egyptians hand over quite easily. Now, of course, remember that this Exodus chapter 12 is happening under duress. There's this, as a, as a narrative tells us, there's a series of plagues and 
And this is the time when the firstborn in all major households um, is killed. So it's not as if um, th there is a happy handover. These are people who are experiencing the, the, the devastation of the economy and their nation. Um, that, that's, that's happening here. Now, of course, the, 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 the editorial note at the end of that verse is an important thing of, of, of understanding that what the Israelites did was akin to, to plundering and robbery. Um, but some of us who would look at this will say this was the settling of accounts of what was an unjust, an unjust relationship. And so if we have the Egyptian ex, um, example to look at, we also have another kind of uh, example that we could pay attention to towards the end of um, what, were, what in the imagination of biblical writers was another form of enslavement, i.e. the Babylonian exile. And when the Persian Empire um, succeeds in its quest to overrun the Babylonian Empire, what happens is they repatriated uh, most uh, people who were deported from their, their homelands back to their homelands. Now, um, this we know, we, there's, a, there's a document in the um, Iranian historical records that indicates to it, there, there's no mention of Judeans as part of that um, largesse, but the Persians did provide um, a, a sense of recognition of the humanity of people who were, de who were deprived by the Babylonians and returned them and assisted in rebuilding temples and, re and rebuilding the, the, the homelands that were devastated by the Babylonian dep depredations. What we have in biblical texts is this imagination that um, that Judeans too benefited from this. So books like Ezra, Nehemiah, and some other smaller prophetic texts um, have this very positive view of the Persians who are empowering returnees from Babylon to rebuild and reconstruct um, Jer Jer Jerusalem. It, it ref ref reflects that general idea that here was an empire that repaired the devastations of imperial oppressions uh, and provided the resources for rebuilding Jerusalem. Again, there, there is a sense of, um, of material address for what would have been a huge um, relationship breach. And then a third um, major uh, feature of this this uh, uh, relationship we're building that, that I, I, I want to cite comes from the example in the book, uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke of uh, Zacchaeus, who, who sits at the heart of an exploitative relationship on behalf of the Roman Empire. He exacts payment from colonialized Judeans on behalf of the Roman Empire. And when he recognizes the, the nature of his work through an encounter with Jesus, Zacchaeus seeks to repair the relationship with the with the people and in a for, in a very public form of repentance he confesses both his 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 complicity as well as provides a commitment for for restitution for for that for that for the, for what he had taken these are some of the kinds of examples that i think that are that are important for us to bear in mind because reparations represent an important step in, in relationship building. Reparations serve as an important moment in strengthening the global community of people, given how the transatlantic slave system impoverished Africa, as we have heard before. For Africa sits as one of the continents that has one of the most uh, the largest deposits of mineral wealth, in fact, the largest deposits of the kinds of mineral wealth that's needed to power the technological advances of our modern world. And yet Africa is the poorest country, continent in the, in the, in the world. But even more, when you map the wealthiest nations on earth, the wealthiest nations on earth at one time or another exploited the wealth of Africa whether uh, through, through unfree labor from his people in the past, but even now, more exploitation of that mineral wealth. In a, so inattention to fixing unequal relationships will perpetuate exploitative structures that do not ensure the full thriving of all, of all people. This virtue that we have of forgiveness cannot stop just simply as a kind of spiritual self but also has to address the material inequities that create, create the problems in the world.
Thank you, Steed. Wow. That was more than a mouthful, but very, very well placed. And thank you for that. Uh, there is a question that is directly related to that. Um, is there liberation or freedom for the enslaver as well as the enslaved in the process of emancipation? I don't know if you wanted to follow up with that, Steve. And then I'll give the, the panelists a chance to respond to each other. I, I think there are ways for us to pay attention to some of these uh, types of um, movements that are that are happening. I, there, there, there are some people who understand that as inheritors of the wealth that was generated by unfree labor, that they have blood on their hands. And so some of them are looking for ways in which that they want to free themselves of that of that taint. And I think that um, speaks to um, one of those places of, of, of liberation. But the important piece about the liberation is we want, if we want to create a world community where everyone belongs and belongs in a sense as a vital human being, participating and sharing and caring rather than just extracting and giving, then, then there is a step of repentance and change and transformation and restitution that needs to happen that can free people in order to, to come into that, into that relationship. Thank you. Um, I will invite us into a, a more fulsome discussion on, I see the financial pieces taking off over here, but I'm going to invite the panelists to respond to each other in this circle. Um, did something trigger something in your own thoughts that you wanted to ask a particular panelist about? Um, or that triggered something that you would want to share? And I will go around the circle again and invite Carol to start. Thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, co-panelists for your uh, really wonderful and informative and very insightful presentations. I have many thoughts and questions, uh, but I will restrict myself uh, and hopefully, you know, we can have further at some point. So um, uh, this is uh, a response and then, and then a, a question, I guess. So um, uh, the response uh, is to uh, Teresa. You know, when you noted the, um, how recent desegregation on um, race in the educational context in Canada and specific to the province of Ontario is, yes, that really resonated with me. And we think that residential schools lasted until what, 1996, 97? Um, and in terms of uh, racial segregation for people of African descent, 1964 in the province of Ontario. So it is a decade later than Brown versus the border of Topeka, Kansas in the United States. And that is often not really reflected on. So I appreciate, that's my response. I appreciate your drawing our attention to um, the relevance of education, both in terms of curriculum, as well as these um, uh, points around uh, segregation and the lasting effects past multicultural Canada of 1971 for the policy in 1988 um, for the act. So I really appreciate that point. Um, for, um, for Steed, you know, my question is this, given the passages that you've um, shown to us, um, in a way, is a Christian text like a blueprint? What is it about the text itself? that lends itself to being a kind of blueprint uh, for empire? And I know it's a contentious question and I've asked it specifically in that way, but I'd really be interested in your response. 
And um, for Isaac, I don't know if we have time for this, but you know, um, I'm very intrigued by what you say in terms of the issues of environmental crisis and their roots in the exploitation of land and, um, and uh, labor processes. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Carol. So what I'm going to invite the people that us to do is that the folks who have been specifically named and asked questions by Carol will respond. And then um, if you have something to point out, you can also do that afterwards. So Teresa. Thank you, Carol. Um, the education piece is very important. Um, and uh, I was just noticing in the Q&A, there's a question about uh, what happened in the West. And that's another part where, um, you know, the, the Indigenous story is pretty clear, um, but Black history is not, um, is not well known. Uh, there's very little written about, for example, the, um, the Black farmers who came up and settled much of Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, the fact that they were considered um, physically incapable of uh, farming because they they felt that the winters would be too, too difficult for them. Give me a break. And yet those histories are are so close to the present. Um, I, I told this story when the uh, the gathering uh, of panelists happened earlier, but um, I was uh, settled as a minister out on the prairies in uh, the mid 2000s. And uh, even then, um, the the history of the clan and its activity um, was deeply rooted in the community and um, shockingly so, actually. Um, and we don't do a good job of helping people understand that when they hear the clan, they think of the states. And we need to own some of that history here. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, there is a, a way for us to acknowledge the biblical text, whether, whether as a Christian document or a cultural document has had a profound impact on shaping um, the, 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 the modern world. And as a document, what it does is remain quite silent on the question of slavery. Um, so enslavement mm -hmm. is just part of the fabric of the culture of the world that it, that it represents. And, and in fact, by the time you get more and more into the Christian era, you get more references to, to slavery and enslavement as, an, an, as, as, a, as a social system that's important um, and important for maintaining the structure of, of empire because enslavement represents uh, one of those substrates of this very hierarchically ordered world created and, and founded by, by, imperial, um, by imperial powers. And, and you, to the extent that what you have in these Christian texts is an imagination that is attracted to the power of empire and doesn't critique it, and doesn't critique its structures and its essential structures, it then trans, trans, uh, translates it, uh, transmits it, and sustains it across centuries to the point where in the modern world, uh, there is no profound indictment of the system of enslavement. No, I don't think that European nations in every case, except for the, the, the ones that were heavily Catholic, the Protestant, the European Protestant nations weren't necessarily following the dictates of biblical, of biblical texts, even though individual um, imperial officers may be following it in their own personal lives. But the absence of, uh, of an indictment, a very clear indictment of the wrongs of, of enslavement creates an atmosphere where it could, be, it could be allowed. And there's no one or very few people who are, who are being formed, 
by this cultural and religious system that feel any qualms about enslavement and, and the practices of enslavement in the, in the world. So to that extent, you know, I, I won't exactly use the word blueprint, um, but I think that there are ways within which the, 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 the text, the, 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 the cultural products, sustains an environment that allows for 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 this hmm. thank you steve Isaac. yeah i just like to follow up on what uh was just uh was just said by by steve by steed um you know when, when i was thinking about that it's important it's of course that's my cat in the background there uh, it's of course important to understand that you know when i look at canada for example you know we can uh, and particularly in nova scotia which i do a lot of research on we can find for example many of the prominent citizens including reverends and pastors were actually slave owners right okay and we know that people found no contradiction between enslaving people and preaching the gospel and we know that at one point uh, in the um, in particularly in the united states but also in the Caribbean, at one point the idea was that people could be or enslaved africans could be christianized which would make them subservient right and servile and less likely to revolt but of course africans reinterpreted the gospel and the scriptures, I'm not a religious person, in ways that were liberatory and emancipatory, right? So I think that's always very interesting, right? How sometimes, in some cases, economic imperatives for some people, the goal of making profit will trump, you know, whatever principles, principles they have. But what's interesting is that, you know, one of the arguments against reparations that emerges, right, okay, is the idea that, well, you know, you're engaged in presentism. Yes, slavery is wrong today. Less this kind of dehumanization is wrong. But it was legal back then. And it was part of the normal practices and so forth. But you can actually go back, and I've documented it and others, where you can find prominent individuals begin uh, who very early at the heyday of slavery see it as being morally wrong as one unchristian okay but but also a violation of natural law right and even people like william the younger and so forth who were prime ministers and so forth of britain they clearly see it that way right so in a sense you know how people develop sort of the moral frameworks in which they can then justify something as horrific as slavery is often dictated by what uh, position they operate in uh, the occupying that economic matrix. I like to make a point about Canada, and I think it's important here as well. Okay, and I think it came up in um, some of the questions of it, but also in some of the comments. You know, Canada has often offered, operated under the conceit that it is not the United States, that slavery did not exist here, that the segregation did not exist here, and so forth. But it's important to understand, right, that not only did slavery exist here, but what we've also discovered is that so much of the Canadian elite were implicated in the financial circuits of the transatlantic slave trade. They didn't actually actually have they didn't actually have to own enslaved African humanity but they were heavily invested, right? And that came out in the Lord Dalhousie report where we demonstrated that Dalhousie University uh, was 30% uh, of its funds were directly linked uh, to customs duties that came out of the transatlantic slave trade, right? So people were heavily invested, particularly in Nova Scotia in, in producing slaving ships. You know, at least 60 slaving ships were produced in Nova Scotia that are involved in the, uh, in the transport of enslaved African humanity. But also on top of that, we also have the fact that even even those uh, uh, groups of uh, people of African descent, black folk who arrived as normally free men and women, black lawless, black refugees, right? Even the farmers coming later, like in, in 1910 from Oklahoma, they faced the legacy of the racist constellation of values and ideas, ideology, okay, that came out of slavery and then sh directly shaped their experiences. And what's interesting uh, is that when we have groups of enslaved Africans, particularly and Imani Whitfield um, has documented this, who come up before the courts fighting for their rights, the courts, even though slavery no longer exists in Canada, at least has, uh, in a sense in Nova Scotia, has withered away for the most part. In fact, use tropes from slavery and thinking from slavery to judge and shape and disfigure the lives of these individuals. And of course, Canada had a keep Canada white immigration policy up until the 60s. And the last point I'd like to make is you can see a, a, a political and legislative foundation for that in a resolution in April of 1850, 1815 in the Legislative Assembly in no, running Nova Scotia in Halifax, where 
um, with the arrival of 2,000 Black refugees or who have basically freed themselves from slavery, they arrive here and they're not seen in a sense as human beings who are being rescued from the horrors of, 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 the, of the inhumanities of slavery, but they're seen slowly as tools of labor to build the political economy of Nova Scotia that can then be tossed away, who are non-citizens and so forth. And when the Nova Scotian economy goes into crisis, a resolution is passed, right? Because what happens is suddenly these black folk who were seen as being, being very important sources of cheap labor and skilled labor are now seen as undesirable. They pass a resolution saying there's too many black people in Can in Nova Scotia. Uh, uh, they create too many problems, and we must do our best to ensure that more do not come to um, to, to Nova Scotia because they're unfit to associate with matches as colonists. I.e., they cannot be seen as citizens, right? So there's a whole constellation of practices and dynamics that that spring directly from slavery that affect people who come here, okay, who may be normally free at that time, but who bear uh, this, the lacerations, both uh, economically, socially, and culturally of the existence of that institution, which creates the case that they too are uh, deserving re uh, recipients of, of, um, of reparations, be it financial, and of course, connected to that should be the kind of social transformation that is ne necessary. All right, thank you. Um... I was just going to comment on David Spencer's uh, contributions, but he's had to leave. Um, and he's invited us to look at specific people who have contributed to the history of the Black presence in Alberta. Um, and I want to, I wonder if this is not feeding into something I think that Carol mentioned and Teresa mentioned that we don't have that piece of our history written. So um, whereas we have researchers and historians doing the work in other areas of Canada that that is lacking. So that may, may be an area that we need to look at. Panelists, there is a question on the Q&A um, that is asking a, a very direct one. How do we engage with uh, Christian churches and the gospel? How can we reinterpret the gospel and Christ so it can be shared in a way that it can be heard, that could challenge racism, white supremacy? Ironically, many people of color are a part of this. It's also challenging. How can we reimagine this? Any ideas? And whilst our panelists are looking at these questions, this question, might I invite other people who are in this discussion to put your uh, comments, your questions in the Q&A, or um, if we have a few minutes, we might invite you to um, contribute live. But yes, first of all, this question. Anybody want to attempt this? Or theologian, Carol, Steve? Well, I will but go ahead, Steve. I'm not a theologian, but you know, I... <laughs> yeah. Well, well I, I'm, I'm I'm glad that the the question is framed in the in the context of reinterpretation, and and that there is not a presumption that what you have is this one static uh, meaning and, uh, and and value that 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 we are that we are we are bound to. And I think it's an important thing that um, one of the, the areas that we're, we're talking about is a decolonizing of the mind and decolonizing of the of the of the of the church, of theology, of all of these different these different types of things to to, to look at at it quite quite differently. I want to go with with where Isaac was heading as a way to answer this question in the sense that. We do not have the luxury, and by we I mean hum human beings, do not have the luxury to pretend as if there is going to be as much viable life on this earth in the future as there was in the past. And that if there is not a significant change in practices, behaviors, habits, and ways within which we just show up and move within the world, where the path is, has, as we have already seen, is unsustainable. So that, so that I, the, 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 the thought of that there was a past that was glorious, that was successful, that was right, that was correct, 
is something that we have to correct, not, not, not because we want to fix the past, but we want to get a future that's sustainable. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of the, the argument that, that, we, that, 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 we, that we work on, that, that we cannot maintain those structures from the past if fairness, justice, and just simply life is going to have to exist in the, in the, in the future. And that, and that goes for the way in which we read the Bible and interpret the text and think about church and all of that. So. Right. Mm-hmm. Carol, just before, Carol had wanted to say. Yeah, I, I um, let me lower my hand here. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for your comments, uh, Steve. Let me just add on that very quickly, that I think that the discussion is well worth um, having. Um, being able to have the capacity to have difficult discussions with those whose ideological or political commitments might be seem vastly different is worth it. I think part of the discourse around climate change and the denial of climate change is precisely linked to the comment that you made about lack of sustainability. If one acknowledges a lack of sustainability, then you have to start to question practices and beliefs about a whole host of other things that are linked, not just with the environment itself, but, you know, um, you know, what are going to be priorities going forward in the very next little while. So I really appreciate that. I just wanted to go back to um, something mentioned by David um, Spence about, you know, the focus on the Eastern and uh, Central Ontario regions of Canada. I could say for myself that in addressing colonial British Empire uh, Canada, that a part of that is looking at those named British colonies of Upper Canada, Lower Canada, for instance, Acadia, and so on. And so for me, historically, looking at Central and East, it's not to negate the Western territories, but historically, those particular grounds, particularly in terms of enslavement of Africans, that's the territory. John Ware, as a cattleman, arrives in Alberta after slavery has ended in the United States in 1865. He arrives in the early 1880s. He dies a few days after the province of Alberta enters Confederation. He dies, I think, September 11th and Alberta becomes a part of the Dominion of Canada earlier that month. And so it might seem that one is being persnickety about these things, but I think the details for regionalism in a country that is as vast as Canada is, as vast as Turtle Island is, on which Canada has instituted itself, is really um, necessary to do so. And I'll leave it there. There is a great question there by Amy Haynes. Yes, yes, and, yes. Um, I'll turn that over to you as moderator, Marlene, for yes, uh, yes. how to address that. And, and her question has a very strong focus on our educational system, um, not just primary, secondary, tertiary, but how an educational system which is deeply based on colonialism um, then affects how we live out our realities in specifically the United Church of Canada. Um, And the question is around how do we uh, change that? How do we dismantle those oppressive systems? And how does dismantling the systems work for those of us in academia and the church where we are subject to these very Western rationalist ideas? So, uh, Teresa, (laughs) and if anyone else in our discussion wants to chime in, sure. I can briefly, briefly, and then after Teresa. Go ahead, Teresa. No, you go ahead, because I'm still formulating my thoughts. Um, Let me just say um, briefly, because it is something that I have had to encounter in my 50 years of living in Canada. I've lived here since 1973, um, after growing up in, in, born in England, grew up in Antigua, Kingston. Um, it's, it's It's an unmaking and a doing at the same time. It's a simultaneous process. Um, and the methods, you know, by which we um, gather and question 
our knowledge claims are also implicated. So all of that is to say is that it is challenging work. It is hard work. It's well worth the reward. There are people who have been doing it for a very, very long time, sometimes unheralded or without um, public um, acclaim or even funding, but have taken it upon themselves um, through uh, the accumulation of their own documents or documentary evidence. I'm thinking here of Arturo Schomburg in the American context and the creation of then the Schomburg collection. Um, in that context to do that. And I'm thinking here also within um, my own province of Ontario context of programs like the Black Education Project um, started by Dr. Kieran Brathwaite, who um, just passed away a few weeks ago um, from Antigua, um, who you know was one of uh, several people who began themselves as students, then a program to um, uh, teach and work with um, black youth and children. I was a student in Black Education Project 50 years ago, um, not very well funded, but it, it, it changed my mind. It let me know that there was something else other than um, not being written into or um, appearing in the book or the books so to speak, and believing, being told, you know, so we had a trip, for instance, a bus trip in the summer uh, that took us, uh, I think, 1974 or so, uh, further west and southwest into the province to see then the dilapidated ruins of what had been a part of a 19th century um, Black settlement of formerly enslaved folks. We saw their schoolhouse. I still remember it, getting off the bus in the steaming heat of August and seeing those creaking boards and that building that was literally on its knees as we saw it. And it was evidence. They were determined that we see that there were other folks who had come before us as Black in Canada. Um, so I think that it, it is both a doing and an undoing. The undoing are uh, being told there's no methods to do it, it's not possible, it doesn't, you know, um, sometimes it takes time and resources and connections in terms of conversations like this with others to be able to do that work. Um, so that's what I wanted to say there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, looking at the United Church in particular, um, Amy, you're right when you talk about the importance of storytelling. Um, the oral tradition does not get um, uh, its due in Western uh, ways of thinking. And that's part of what need just needs to change. When I think of the most powerful pieces of um, um, storytelling, I've heard, for example, uh, with Black History Month, they've been stories that have been passed on from grandparents to grandparents to grandparents kind of thing, and are finally shared um, in our communities. That, that storytelling is absolutely essential and we need to honor that oral tradition. We're not doing very good at it in the United Church of Canada. Um, I can offer you uh, one story. And that is, I there is, uh, a piece of legislation before um, our church courts right now um, that uh, is asking for um, space for the Indigenous community to form uh, as they need to form in the United Church of Canada. And I went before my region and what I realized is we couldn't even talk about this uh, remit because they didn't know their neighbors. They didn't know who the indigenous people were in the church that they were talking about. And so I had to take 20 minutes and explain it. And unfortunately, um, I think that storytelling needs to happen uh, across the board. And we have some amazing stories uh, within the black community in the United Church of Canada. And we've got to get those stories out. That's what I would say. All right, thank you. As we're talking about the importance of storytelling and the oral tradition, um, I wonder if we can have a few minutes where we might invite
uh, questions from the floor. If you have a question and you want to, to, to ask it to the panelists without writing it, please raise your hand and the host will give you permission to, um, to share your question or ask your question or share your comment. So please use the raise hand feature and do that as we honor the fact that this is part of our tradition and the cultures as represented here. Um, while we're waiting for folks to formulate their questions, um, yeah, is there any other, it's Isaac, I know you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just want to build on what uh, Carol was saying. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that's important to understand is that in the wake of the George Floyd uprisings, when I, I pre presage this, is when they were taking place and the demonstrations were taking place in Halifax, I think the Canadian ruling elite or ruling circles, whatever term we wish to use, were taken aback by their size and the fact that people were clearly uh, not, solid, not only engaging in solidarity actions with what was going on in the United States, but saying we have the same problems here in Canada, right? We have the same denial and erasure and elision, right? And, uh, of history and, prepare, and pretending it didn't happen, as well as ignoring all the problems here as well. So what came out of that uh, and, uh, was a number of very important initiatives, limited, okay, uh, not, uh, not perfect, but I think important things. And one of the things within uh, the university sector was the Scarborough Charter which was signed and which, you know, people like Barrington Walker, who is a very well-known historian and others wrote. I mean, it was written specifically by black academics and black scholars. And I think it's a very important instrument that may die a sad, lonely, dusty death on the shelf somewhere, but may also be used. And people are trying to use it as a means by which to, at least to hold the university's feet to the fire. The president signed off on this in a, of university universities in a very ostentatious and public and ceremonial manner. And we can use the Scarborough Charter, which specifically talks about education, talks about black faculty, talks about students, talks about programs and so forth. And one of the results of that, in a sense, coming from community pressure, has been the Black and African Diaspora Studies Program at Dalhousie University, the first one in Canada, and so far the only one where you can actually do a degree in Black Canadian Studies, and so on, where we have a Black Studies Research Institute here as well. And also we've seen a number of documentaries that have been made about Black Canadian history as well, right? I'm fearful, Unfortunately, and I think it's happened with Truth and Reconciliation, and around the uh, we see it also in terms of the revelations of all these children who were kidnapped and basically killed, right, at these schools, we see now sort of like a, a compassion fatigue. Uh, 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 and we see it in terms of polls, right, and elections, a blowback by those who wish to return to the cold, old kind of, you know, uh, you know, uh, white only where people of color and indigenous people, you know, were, were, were in their socially segregated places, okay? What happened to my Canada? So we're back in that particular place. But we do have tools to, to, to um, uh, tools with which to wage the struggle. And we do still have a significant amount of people who at least I see at university, some very conscientious people who want to transform the sphere of the academy and so forth. So a lot of stuff is taking place. And one day, and I'll end on this point, one of the things that really um, uh, sort of, sort of uh, warms my heart is I teach an introduction to African Canadian studies. I'm teaching it again this fall. And we always have huge turnouts of students, most of them are white, right? Who are very interested interested in this history and are very upset that they haven't learned it, right? And come out of it, I think, transformed by that experience, right? So once again, you know, I know Steve spoke about the fact that we may not have as much viable life in the next little while, okay? So it's a very frightful picture that worries me as I prepare, you know, that I have a, as, a, as, a, as I have a five-year-old, but I'm also optimistic about the young people and perhaps to draw on the Black prophetic tradition, right? Okay, it's always driven by optimism and it's always driven that Black liberation is essential for human liberation as a whole. Okay, thank you. All right. We don't seem to have any more questions. Yes, and we need to work together to repair relationships. It is a collective effort indeed, um, something that can only be done in community. Um, and it will then have great effects on the entire community. I am going to invite our panelists to 
offer closing remarks, if you would, and they can be as concise as possible. Um, and that would be greatly appreciated. I'll start in reverse order and invite the Reverend Dr. Steed to begin. Thanks. Um, there's a peculiar it's a, um, experience that, that we have had in the last four or 500, you know, 550 50 years on this question of, of, en of enslavement because it, it is tied into anti-Blackness. And I think I heard, you know, between uh, 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 Carol and Isaac hinting, hinting at this, that there, there is that unique uniqueness. And that is why this issue of reparations tend to have the, uh, let, me, let me put it this way, the color and the tenor that it has, precisely because there is a there's a there's a there's a structured anti-blackness that has framed the modern the modern world. And that's a fundamental thing that needs to be addressed and and changed. And of course, there will continue to be resistance to this. Um, I, I'm not too sure of what um, systems look like in, in Canada, whether there are wholesale. Um, educational systems and states like we have here in Florida that, that want to engage in the kind of cultural and social amnesia Carol referred to, or the kinds of um, rewriting and um, uh, uh, in, reimagining in, 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 ne in, in negative ways. I mean, having, having said that, the, the, the issue has been for us to confront this reality of an economic system that says for the only way for it to work, it has to be upon the backs of mm -hmm. cheap, free, and unfree labor. And there are different configurations of that happening in our, in our, in our world today. And, and this the sense of uneven wealth and inequality that co-ops people in middle spaces and medium spaces to then ascend to that structure and see themselves as superior to the, to the underclass is something that needs to be confronted. And, and there are two places, and if I, if I kind of channel some of the, the ideologies of Rastafari, two of the spaces that help to, to sustain that, that ideology are churches and, and educational systems. And until, until the religious and educational systems really become and see themselves as advocates, not for the status quo, but for the underclass, the oppressed, and those who are, who are, who are, who are set out, then essentially what you have is co-opting and, uh, and calling people into systems to sustain these, 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 these measures of, in, of, 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 of inequality. Um, and, and so, you know, fortunately, I kind of a move between between two within between both of those spaces, and I and that's where a lot of my passion and confidence and hope comes from, that yet those systems can be reformed, <laughs> and that they can change, and that they can repent, and that they can pay repay their dues. Yes, thank you, Prof. Isaac. Well, I just like to say I'm uh, I I am my optimism. As I feel the fuel by someone such as Steed, who is um, in Florida, and I can imagine how difficult it is in Florida with that current political climate. I just like to say, you know, get just to build on his point. When one thinks of Martin Luther King in the last years of his life, uh, you know, his Beyond Vietnam speech, for example, and organizing the march on Washington, is he spoke about fundamental political and economic and social change as necessary for human survival, right? For creating a world fit for human beings, and. The transatlantic slave system, you know, it's constitutive of this, this global economic system. We can call it global capitalism. Uh, it really is racial capitalism. I don't think there is a capitalism that is not racial historically. Uh, people have this theoretical debate. And the transatlantic slave was, was essential not only for the leading to its development, its origin, and, 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 and its, and its uh, cementing, but also the things that derive from it have, uh, are very much constitutive of, of the world's economic and social system we exist in today. So that's why global Black liberation, uh, I think, and reparations is so much anathema uh, 
to various of the world powers. We know that at the United Nations World Conference Against Racism, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance that was held in 2001 in Durban, which is now which was forgotten about, but is now resurging, right, as the global as the Pan-African uh, reparation movements begins to gain steam, that the, the powers that be, particularly Canada, not only deny the necessity for reparations, because they know that reparations and a very concept of reparations in its deepest and most profound sense, i.e. Black liberation, necessarily means a fundamental reconstruction of the system that exists, of all the inequalities, injustices, and the hierarchies of privileges, right, that have led to the world that we live in today, right? So that's why I've often said and end when I've given my talks on reparations that Black liberation necessarily means all of humanity's liberation. Amen. Amen. Teresa. Yeah. That was a mouthful you ended up with there, Isaac. Black liberation uh, is all of humanity's liberation. And that is so true. Um, what gives me hope is conversations like these ones and the fact that they're happening across jurisdictions. Um, what gives me hope um, within the United Church of Canada is seeing that we in fact are doing some anti-racist training. We're actually doing some work to, to make that happen. And people are starting to get serious about what it means when we start, when we talk about equity. Um, that gives me hope. I, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Carol. Uh, two things. I think um, echoing some of what we've already heard, I think it's very important to share stories. And that's in the comment from, I think, Julian Gay Graham. Um, and the idea of repairing relationships, not just on an interpersonal level um, with individuals, but also relationships with land. I always think of my mother's mother, my grandmother who raised me, and her contention that the young generation, the gingeration, should say, us, and smile, that we, many of us did not want to put our hands in earth, did not want to put our hands in soil, had kind of an aversion, if you will, to um, the agricultural process. And she was a wonderful, marvelous gardener. Her kitchen garden, in fact, fed us and fed other people. She was a lettuce supplier to a local grocer, for example, to help look after the chickens and she sold the eggs over the fence and all of that. But there was an aversion because of the horrible experience of coerced labor with land for people of African descent in the Americas, but indigenous folks as well, and white folks, Asian folks, folks of all kind of color, because you know the system required, especially in a Caribbean context, we have the examples. Um, it required labor that was free, unfree, and every color. Franklin W. Knight, thank you for that in your marvelous uh, book on the history of the Caribbean, uh, the kind of fragmented uh, experience. So reparative relationships with land, with the natural environment, with individuals. We see from the historical record people who tried to do that individual slave owners who were trying to free folks on their deathbed or within their will, their last will and testament. Is it reparative? Sorta, kinda, does it fully meet the mark? Not really, I would, one would say, you know, because the, the, the truth telling and the face to face doesn't happen. And maybe that person was doing that in terms of their own theological conceptions of meeting their maker and so forth. Um, we see it in contemporary generations of folks of tremendous wealth who are inheritors of those legacies, who are trying to do something different with that. So yes, sharing stories and reparations as repairing relationships. And the, the second part is the, uh, I think it's necessary to challenge the worldview of history as losers and winners. And when I'm speaking with introductory students often, 
is a course I teach from time to time, Religions of the Americas, Indigenous, African, and European. And it's the colonial history through the lens of religious experience, spirituality, uh, and all of the buttings and changes and associations and uh, adaptations and so on. And often that comes up. And that leads back to what I said at the beginning, that restorative, yes, but there's that question often of retribution, which raises itself as a kind of um, folk devil, bogey figure of who won't pay it. Hmm. It can't be paid. You can't pay that. You're giving me how much? Thou mm -mm -mm, sorry. That is actually insulting to think you can pay it. You know, there's that attitude, right? Of who going to pay it, really, in terms of retribution, that it's inadequate. And Isaac talked about that as kind of a reductionist, sort of neoliberal um, approach, that it can be just, it's about money. No. Yes, that's the means through which the resources and so forth in where we are now. But I think at the heart of that is that view of, of history of winners and losers. It's unidirectional. It is a fait accompli. You lost. And as a loser of history, you must continue to lose and lose and pay and pay again. Okay. To that you. view, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's think That's about true, it, do yeah. something different. So All thank right. you so much for that. All right. I see Franklin is here, ready to, to do his wrap up and we will do that. Um, Isaac is going to put a link to an event that he is um, involved with. He's going to put it in the chat for everyone to see. And I will um, offer my closing remarks to this piece and then hand over to uh, Franklin by saying the words of the prophet, the prophet Bob Marley, that until the philosophy that holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, everywhere is war, a disruption of peace. May we be the disruptors that are needed for this to happen. Let me give a heartfelt thanks for each panelist that spoke, Isaac, Teresa, Speed, and Carol. Um, I believe the silence in the question and answer section means that you gave us a lot to think about. There's a lot for us to process and some of us to come to speed within understanding the whole idea around reparation, its nuances, and steps we can take. So I appreciate and applaud all the views and want to thank each of you who presented on behalf of the Black Clergy Network deeply for your work and for your gift to us this time of the day. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to say thanks to our moderator, Marley. You did a splendid job as always. It's a pleasure working with you. And I know he likes to remain in the silent corners, but Paul has been very, I should say, a beam, a support, a drive in having this panel happen. And he deserves to be applauded for the work he did and is doing um, within the panel. And, still working behind the scene in Black Clergy Network. Without him, I would be lost and at sea. So thank you so much, Paul, for all that you have been doing and continue to do for us. And of course, all of you who participate by tuning in, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here, to listen, and to devote yourselves intentionally to this panel. Thank you so much for turning up, for showing up, and for listening deeply and intentionally. So thank you so much. And I also want to say a big thank you to the United Church of Canada Foundation. They have been supportive all along from the first panel discussion 
to this one and we want to give a big shout out and a big thank you to the United Church of Canada Foundation. So once again, thank you to each and every one of you. And as you go into the rest of your activities, I give you this blessing. May the Lord guide us with wisdom and courage as we leave this event. Let the insights gained here inspire us to be agents of hope and justice. Go forth with conviction and compassion, blessed and empowered into your next activity and may our Christ be with you always. Amen. Thank you.